War Zone, Damnos. Damnos is a frozen, ice-bound world, with a chilling secret lurking beneath its crust. The planet's human settlers awoke an unholy terror so powerful that even the might of the Ultramarine Second Company could not match it. Only full-scale war between the Adeptus Astartes and the Necron battle host could restore humanity's faith in its own supremacy. The world of Damnos, a mining planet in the eastern Ultima Segmentum, was settled long ago in the days of the Great Crusade. Humanity had dwelt there for the best part of 10,000 years, carving settlements and man-made canyons into the permafrost as they delved ever deeper in search of mineral wealth. Yet the Imperial settlers were not the first to lay claim to Damnos, for another race had slumbered under the ice from time immemorial. The mining planet's fusion generators had been sunk amongst the ruins of an ancient Xenos civilization. The first sign of the dormant presence beneath the planet's skin was a series of powerful earthquakes over the course of 274973.M41, a tectonic upheavals that wreaked havoc amongst the icy mine chasms of the world. In the wake of these tremors, the geothermic station arrays of Mandos Prime and suffered a series of critical failures. Teams of repair servitors and exofabricators were sent in, and as they hunted down each station's sanctity engines for repair, the glare of their labs illuminated unnatural shapes and runes, revealed by the earth-shattering quakes, shapes that certain factions of the Imperium would give almost anything to capture and investigate. Once rumours got out about the discoveries, Magus Karnak of the Adeptus Mechanicus was quick to assume command of the excavation. His tech priests took control over all the mining operations taking place across the planet, and a number of Xenos samples were taken back to the stronghold of Goth Majoris for study. Much to their frustration, however, they were unable to gain access to the arcane portals frozen into the ruins. It would not be long before their curiosity was sated once and for all. The seismic activity was little more than a precursor to the carnage to come. In 779973M41, the original inhabitants of Damnos awoke. All across the planet, the skeletal machine creatures known as Necrons began to emerge from the chasms and fissures left by the tectonic upheaval. Their numbers were staggering. All who set eyes upon them knew that they brought death and death alone. First of all were the ice mine colonies, monstrous canaptic spiders and swarms of scarabs, boiled out of the darkness, slaughtering the panicking miners with emerald gorse beams and silvered claws. A handful of workers survived long enough to reach the nearest settlements and manufactorums, but the Necrons were not far behind. Within the space of half a year, the majority of Damnos's tomb complexes had been awoken from their deathless slumbers. Phalanx upon phalanx of Necrons stalked out into the icy air of the surface world, tightly packed ranks that were endless in number. The planetary defence force found itself under attack from a foe so advanced that even death could not stop them. To make matters worse, terrible storms erupted across Damnos Prime, the electromagnetic spectres that accompanied them, making distress calls all but impossible. It seemed to the citizens of Damnos that the storms acted with a malevolent sentience, clustering around comm centres and scrambling cogitator engines whenever a Vox Psalm link was established. The Ark Guard, a garrison regiments of which were posted right across Damnos, had no hope of bringing their full might to bear with their Vox network disabled by the Necron comm shroud. Everywhere they engaged the Xenos, their tanks were blasted into smoking ruin by the weird techno-sorcery of the Necrons. Though they fought bravely, the planetary defence force had no real chance. The defenders of Damnos Prime were systematically disintegrated, one settlement at a time. Within the space of a few months, the entire continent of Damnos Prime had fallen as silent as the grave.
As the weeks passed, it became obvious to the citizens of Damnos Secundus that an event of planet-threatening magnitude was taking place. Fortunately, the Tyrian Ocean sat between the capital city, Kellenport, and the rising Xenos threat. Lord Governor Arxis almost choked on his amasar when the seaborne fleet, known as the Tyrian Vessel Web, reported a dense formation of pyramidal structures crossing the waters in his direction. According to the Vessel Web's scrambled reports, the Cyclopean structures were not born upon the ocean waves, but hovering above them. The Xenos war engines were arranged in a grid formation, an ancient city that had somehow come to life. Crescent-shaped attack craft patrolled the channels between each segment, and the whole formation was surrounded by green lightning that obliterated the Imperial vessels monitoring its progress. More disturbing still, the vessel web detected the energy signature of an extra-dimensional sinkhole, uh, pulsing below them deep in the Tyrrhenian abyss. The ocean itself was draining away at the floating city's passage. The Lord Governor immediately mobilised every regiment under his command. Art Guard, Valian Dragoon and Cadian Shock Trooper alike scrambled to combat readiness. It's amazing they didn't do that in the first place. He called the Imperial battleship Nobilis into geostationary orbit above Kalenimport and retreated to his Proteus-class command bunker, ordering his astropaths to send out a plea for aid. Being psychic in nature, the distress call bypassed the Necron comm shroud and echoed out across the ether. None other than Chief Liberian Tigarius of the Ultramarines intercepted the transmission, relaying it to the headstrong Captain Sicarius of the Second Company. Deep in the reaches of space, the strike cruiser Valens Revenge set a course for Damnos. Later that week, a picked cast from the massacre in Hallaheim reached the major population centres of Damnos Secundus. Its horrific visuals were accompanied by a Necron hologram relaying a message in staccato high gothic. The content was clear. This world belonged to the Necrons, and they would scour humanity from its surface without remorse. With Imperial morale at a new low, the Necron warfront burnt a path across Damnos Secundus until, by 020974M41, Kalenimport was completely besieged. Scattered Vox snippets and pick skull footage reported heavy and sustained bombardment from crescent-shaped pylon guns, each the size of an imperial hab block, that had broken through the permafrost to spit beams of green fire into the skies. Every time the imperial defenders brought their tank battalions or macro cannon emplacements to bear, they would be swiftly obliterated by the eye-searing lightning of the gorse pylons. Furthermore, the Necron warrior constructs were proving incredibly durable. Lasfire barely scorched them, and they stalked through clouds of burning Prometheum without harm, and even when a lucky shot put one of the deathless constructs down. It would often rise up once more to rejoin the fray, eroding the fighting spirit of the Imperial defenders to the point that military cohesion became all but impossible. Crippled by internal division and panic, the teeming hive of Arcona City was mercilessly depopulated within the space of a day. Only a thin line of Imperial Guard now lay between the Necron war phalanxes and Kalenimport itself. However, Marxists still had a trump card to play. As the capital city was besieged by a Necron force of unprecedented size, the Imperial battleship Nobilis rain down barrage after barrage of melter torpedoes from orbit high above, incinerating a good portion of the Necron army on the plains surrounding the city. With each detonation, a great cheer went up from the Imperial Guardsmen and ex-minor militia who were yet defending the city. Just as it seemed the tide of the battle would turn in the Imperials' favour, thick lances of emerald fire shot up from the Necron gorse pylons to slam through the Nobilis' shields and carved through its hull. The detonation of the ship's warp drives lit the sky above Kalenimport with a maddening kaleidoscope of light. In the nearby Crastia shipyards, an eclectic fleet of ships was powering up in the hope of a last-minute evacuation. Before they could launch, however, 
they were overrun by flesh-wrapped nightmares that rose from the ground to tear apart the terrified refugees with razored claws. Lord Governor Arxis didn't even reach the door of his command bunker before a swarm of burrowing Necron tomb constructs breached his haven and pulled him apart. Outclassed and with their morale in tatters, the surviving defenders commended their souls to the Emperor and retreated into Kalenimport's inner bastion complex. In their panic, the blue symbol flickering on Arx's holylyph array had gone unnoticed. The Ultramarines of the Second Company, alerted to Damnos's plight by the astropathic summons, translated from the warp into real space above the beleaguered planet. Captain Cato Sicarius ordered the Valens Revenge to approach Damnos from the shelter of the Nobilis's remains. This proved to be a wise tactic, for the Necrons responded by sending great beams of gorse energy arcing towards the strike cruiser. It remains a testament to the skill of the Revenge's helmsman that it was not torn apart or torn in half. Nonetheless, such was the volume of incoming fire that the strike cruiser was hit three times, shuddering with each impact. The last gorse beam wounded Valan's revenge sorely, but not before the Ultramarines had launched their drop pods towards the planet's surface, scarring the skies like a rain of blazing comets. Sicarius's orbital strike force hammered down into the plazas and boulevards of Kalenimport, deploying from their drop pods in perfect Codex Astartes dispersal patterns with their bolters blazing. Chainsword and heavy weapon alike brought the fury of the Adeptus Astartes to the Necron phalanxes, but even when the Space Marines had joined forces with the surviving Imperial Guard, the Xenos did not bow before their onslaught. Many good men were lost before the Space Marines eventually secured a costly victory. It was a story that would become bitterly familiar over the rest of the campaign. The Adeptus Astartes fought with every weapon at their disposal, testing their mettle against a succession of Necron lords and fighting that their alien foes were every bit as ruthless and indomitable as themselves. Yet Sicarius would not yield. The gorse pylons were disabled or destroyed one by one, allowing the Ultramarines to land their armoured support and reinforce their embattled brethren. Captain Sicarius himself cut down dozens of Necron raiders and single-handedly crippled a looming Necron war engine with a well-placed grenade. In the end, though, the heroics of the Second Company barely slowed the Xenos advance. In every theatre of war, the Ultramarines were struggling to hold the Necrons at bay. Captain Sicarius led from the front, as was his custom. Despite his valour, he found his attacks stymied by the near-infinite numbers of the foe. In his frustration, Sicarius sought to buy his men the time they needed by using himself and his command squad as bait. It was not long before Sicarius had hacked a path to the Pharon, acting as supreme overlord of the Xenos force, a gilded giant of a Necron known as the Undying. A searing blast from Sicarius's plasma pistol tore off the creature's jaw, yet still it came on. The duel was closely matched, but the Necron leader's raw strength proved a deciding factor. Its war scythe cut down into the captain's torso, dealing a grievous wound that laid Sicarius low. Roaring from his vox grills, the venerable dreadnought Agrippan stormed through the Necron ranks to protect the body of the fallen captain. Crushed beneath the armoured behemoth's battle fury, the Xenos overlord phased out and returned to the darkness of its tomb. In the absence of a guiding hand, the Necron legion fell back on defensive protocols that were predictable and slow a critical weakness that saw hundreds of them destroyed. Sicarius's men recovered their stricken leader, driving the Xenos army back before withdrawing as planned to the evacuation site. Sicarius had tasted defeat in battle for the first time, though the valiant rearguard had allowed the planet's survivors time to withdraw. Over half of the second company had given their lives in exchange for those of a few thousand refugees. It was a hard-won victory indeed. Each space marine is worth more to the Imperium than a hundred lesser men, and Damnos still rested in the hands of the Necrons. The fall of Damnos, though amongst the first full-scale conflicts between the Ultramarines and the Necrons, 
had proven far from unique. The rise of the Necrons had continued apace all across the Imperium. One by one, their tomb worlds had awoken and begun to rebuild their empire, initially by conquest of their upstart settlers that had taken residence on sovereign Necron soil, and later by the relentless and mercilessly efficient invasion of nearby worlds and systems. News of the Necron threat had spread far and wide, and despite the best efforts of the Inquisition to suppress all knowledge of the alien empire's resurrection, worse still, the fact that the Xenos were powerful enough to triumph against not only the Imperial Guard, but also the Adeptus Astartes and the Ultramarines, at that, had shaken the Imperium's faith in its military supremacy. Reports of once prosperous worlds yielding to Necron reconquest across Ultrama Segmentum eventually found their way to Terra. Incensed by their loss, the fabricated general of the Adeptus Mechanicus united the High Lords in a fateful accord. An example had to be made. The Ultramarines would be tasked with returning to Damnos in force and eradicating the Necron threat infesting it once and for all. Only then would the point be made to the galaxy at large. Nothing, be it demon, heretic, or Xenos fiend, could stay the wrath of the Adeptus Astartes. The news came to Ultramar in the form of the most experienced Death Watch strike teams the Ordo Xenos could provide, led by Squad Lazarus, a crack insertion unit that had successfully destabilized the catacomb world of Diadalon. The High Lords believed that the specialist skills of the Death Watch could make all the difference to the success of the attack. Better yet, they knew that the Ultramarines were more likely to accede to a request made by a Space Marine than by a robed functionary of the Adeptus Terror. Rumour had it that one of the Death Watch sergeants who arrived in Ultramar was Davian Armaclass, an old squadmate of Sicarius's, and that the two friends broke Ultramar protocol by meeting before official greetings had been observed. Still, the arrival of the Death Watch was cause for much discussion in the ranks of the Ultramarines, for they above all Imperial forces were trained to neutralise and destroy Xenos entities. When Watch Captain Lazarus relayed the news of the High Lord's plan, to Manius Calgar on the idyllic world of Hera, the chapter master was far from pleased. Calgar had extensively reviewed Sicarius's after-action reports following the previous incident on Damnos, and he knew full well that the second company had faced but a small portion of the Necron's true strength. This time, his Ultramarines would face a fully awakened tomb world, teeming with Necron defences. Calgar's thoughts had long been troubled by the true scale of the threat, lurking under Damnos's icy crust. The chapter master knew he would lose many hundreds of good men in the reconquering of Damnos, yet the course was clear. The Ultramarines had failed to destroy their foes during the fall of Damnos, a failure that had to be remedied. Though he was loath to admit it, Calgar knew in his heart that the High Lords were right. The morale of the Imperium was at stake. It was the duty of the Ultramarines to see the battle they had started decades ago to its bloody conclusion. Twenty-five years had passed before the Spectre of Damnos had come back to haunt the Ultramarines. It was a whole generation for mortal men, though a relatively short span in the lifetime of a space marine. The Second Company had won countless victories since Damnos, but the ordeals upon the Xenos-infested planet had not been forgotten. Many of the Ultramarines who had fought there, were still anxious for redemption. This was true, most of all, of Cato Sicarius, the grievous blow dealt to him by the Necron monarch, outside Kaleninport, and long since healed. But the wound to his pride remained. So it was that when Marius Calgard announced that the warriors of Ultramar would return to Damnos in full force, the second company with them, Captain Sicarius smiled for the first time in decades. After the original fall of Damnos, the rescued settlers had been relocated to Tarantus, an agri-world upon the fringe of the Ultramar Empire. The Damnosians had begun new lives, working hard to repatriate themselves as citizens of that great realm. As the soldiers and miners put their haunted past aside to start new families and fresh careers, a new generation grew to young adulthood. The surviving Damnosians 
had already impressed the warriors of Ultramar with their valour and bravery on the field of battle, and their sons and daughters had worked and trained so hard that they had also won the respect of the Adeptus Astartes watching over them. Some had even proven strong enough to become Ultramarines in their own right, the Tenth Company squad known as the Ice Talons, trained under Torius Talion, were of Damnosian stock. Marius Calga was always a wise and prudent leader. He knew that the upcoming war was as much about the Imperium soul as it was the body, and so he gave the refugee families of the ice planet a chance to fight for the world they had been forced to abandon. Almost every adult amongst them volunteered. For many of the hardy settlers, it was the only hope they had of banishing the mechanical skeletons that stalked their dreams. The Imperial war engine slowly began to gather speed. The first, second, third, fifth, and sixth companies of the Ultramarines were mustered from war zones within the Ultima Segmentum, over 500 space marines, to be led into battle by Kalgar himself. All extant information on Damnos was dissected in painstaking detail, and the training cages rang night and day with the sound of steel on steel. It was said that Cato Sicarius trained so hard he even slept in the cage vault, and that he fought with the fury of a man possessed. Before the month was out, Kalgar's preparations were complete. Editor's note. The following information about the progress of the Ultramarine's fleet is very odd, and I don't think it quite makes sense. It must be some error in the records. Instead of translating from the warp into Damnos's orbit, the Grand Fleet of Ultramar emerged within the neighbouring planet of Utinus, an inert gas giant with a radioactive asteroid belt. Once more, the Ultramarine fleet's helmsman proved up to their allotted task. Well, yes, emerging within a planet probably will be quite a big job for any pilot, I would have thought. The Imperial warships entered real space within the outer layers of the gas giant, completely hidden from sight by swirling vapours. Anyway, moving on. Kalgar's next order was for the torpedo batteries of the Victrix Ultra to detonate several macro-class warheads near to the planet's asteroid belt, knocking the largest of their number out of orbit and sending them sailing past Damnos. One by one, the asteroids detached from the Utanus belt. Slowly, with utmost caution, the Ultramarine's fleet went with them. To the Damnosian cryptex observing the celestial event, the electronic signatures of the fleet were lost amongst the radioactive rocks. Reports of the Utanas event were relayed, but the Necron lords of Damnos were far more concerned with their own power struggles. They paid the oncoming shower of debris little heed. Kalgar's approach plan had worked perfectly. By the time the Necrons on the surface had spotted their presence, the Ultramarines' warships were already in position to launch their drop pods. Wave after wave of the craft flared bright as they crackled through the upper atmosphere plummeting towards the surface of Damnos with tooth-rattling speed. The fully active pylon networks below intercepted dozens of the hurtling drop pods, stitching the skies with green lightning and smashing many of the attack craft into thousands of pieces. The pylons had accessed the position data from the invasion of the second company all those years ago, and their targeting systems predicted the descent patterns well. Those few that made it through the gorse net slammed into the surface of Damnos and opened to reveal that they held no space marines but automated weaponry. It was then that the decoy tactic became clear. The strike cruisers Hera's Fist, Blade of Judgment, Talisar's Tempest and Lion of Kalf dived out from the asteroid cloud and roared towards the planet's surface south of Kalenin Port. Within seconds of breaking cover, the warships had hurled their drop pods from their launch bays, each carrying a squad of space marines. The Gorse Pylon Network could not recalibrate their firing solutions in time to intercept Kalgar's true invasion force. As the landing craft made planetfall and slammed open, hundreds of space marines deployed into perfect formation. Death Watch strike teams, emerging from black armoured drop pods into the depths of the Necron tomb complexes, moved in to begin missions of sabotage against the Necron reinforcements moving to surround the Ultramarines. On the Belenos ice plains behind them, 
bulk landers lowered their ramps to disgorge regiments of vengeful Imperial Guard. The Imperium had arrived in force. In the heart of the tomb complexes that surrounded Kalenimport, monoliths and cyclopean obelisks shuddered free of the ice and rose majestically into the air. Piece by piece, the floating necropolis that had scoured human life from Damnos assembled itself once more. Fully powered, the grid of deadly war machines drifted towards the space marines with the inevitability of death itself. Doom scythes wailed into the skies on intercept courses with the Thunderhawk gunships that reinforced the ground assault. The crescent-shaped Necron fighters flew with uncanny maneuverability, carving off whole sections of their enemy's fuselage with rays of energy. Though the Ultramarine Storm Ravens returned fire, three of the mightiest Space Marine craft were crippled beyond recovery. The Thunderhawk Vengeance Uluxis uh, turned end over end, trails of greasy black smoke scouring the sky as it ploughed into the Ultramarines scattering below. The collision crippled two whole squads, but it slowed the Imperial advance not for one moment. Incredibly, several of the Space Marine passengers fought their way free of the Vengeance's burning debris and joined the ranks of their brethren, bloodied but unbowed. The rest of the Ultramarine's transports landed, releasing squadrons of predators, hunters and vindicators from their armoured bellies whilst cohorts of war-suited centurions laid down covering fire with daunting precision. Company by company, the Ultramarine squads tuck up position near the pyramidal complex that Calgar identified as the heart of the Necron grid. They were making good progress until the floating city hovered into view. A crackling field of green energy arced around the Xenos formation, dispersing the Laz cannon fire of the Predator assassin squads, testing its defences. In return, the thunderous bolts of emerald lightning lashed out from the crystal atop each of the monoliths grounding spectacularly in the ranks of the space marines and sending power-armoured limbs spinning high into the air. The source of the crackling energy became clear as the Xenos formation crested the ridge. In the centre of the grid hummed four angular quadrants linked by bolts of energy. Shining within their interior was a sphere of blinding light that held a splayed humanoid form. The green lightning that crackled out to surround the necropolis was eye-searingly bright wherever it touched the writhing creature inside the sphere. Ahead of it came the silhouette of the Undying, reborn once more and leading his high court to war. Calgar's hand had been forced. Sending a tight beam transmission to his reserves in orbit, he summoned a precise orbital bombardment followed by a teleport strike from a full half of the First Company. Battle was about to be joined in earnest. At the head of the chapter's librarius, Chief Librarian Tagarius locked his gaze with that of the bound creature and strained to understand the titanic technologies that were being brought to bear against it, wiping tears of blood from his cheeks. The librarian mind-linked a message to Manius Kalgar. The shining figure inside was the physical incarnation of a Catan star god. A legend given form and bound against its will to power the Necron engines of war. It was imperative that the towering creature be neutralized, for it was the source of the floating necropolis's defense shield, and it had the power to turn Damnos itself against them. As phalanx after phalanx of Necrons stalked across the snows, the ground war began in earnest. Volleys of long-range missile fire from Whirlwind and Thunderfire cannon batteries thundered into the Necrons stalking towards the Imperial ranks, knocking dozens of the creatures from their feet with each explosion. As per Kalgar's orders, wherever the Necrons slumped into the snow, the Ultramarine tactical squads would advance and pour fire into it to ensure it did not rise again. Yet the phalanxes lurched onward, crushing the fallen underfoot. As one, the entire column of Necrons halted at some invisible signal, raised their gorse flares and fired a strobing fusillade of energy into the ranks of the Ultramarines. The beams stripped away armour, 
flesh and bone, until the remains of once proud space marines writhed steaming in the snow. In response, massed assault squads and a thunderous cadre of dreadnoughts ploughed into the tightly packed ranks of the foe. Chainswords and power fists chewed through cables and crushed mechanical sinews, forcing the Necrons to abandon their fire discipline and fall upon the new threat in melee. Sicarius stormed forward to reinforce his men, but the Xenos numbers were thickening as ever more constructs emerged from the ice. As the High Suzerain barged his way through the Necron warriors closing in on his battle brothers, keening packs of flayed ones pulled their way out of the permafrost and impaled the raging space marines from below with their razor-sharp talons. In their midst was a leaping, slashing monster of metal and stolen skin, whose every blow hurled an assault marine ten feet across the ice. Sicarius made a beeline for the creature, raising his tempest blade in the briefest of salutes, before engaging it in a lightning-fast exchange of blows. To the south of the Ultramarine's army, the Tarantine Imperial Guard uh, took a heavy toll on waves of approaching destroyers and on the Tomb Blades, escorting ghost arcs towards the Ultramarine's flank. Battle cannon shells detonated in the midst of the Xenos, stunning the Necron gun constructs and leaving them easy prey for ruby beams of Laz cannon fire from the guardsmen manning the gantries of the nearby research station. Harsh shouts of triumph were soon replaced by piercing screams as portal-bearing night scythes translocated Necron warriors into their midst. It was all the chance the destroyers needed. The second wave of the malevolent machine beasts rose out of the snow to exterminate any guardsmen who dared sneak a glance over the armoured parapet. Everywhere the Imperial armies struck, the Necrons countered with lethal force. Kalgar felt like a duelist being slowly taken apart by a superior foe. The battlefield logic of the Necrons was impeccable. Whatever intelligence was controlling the Xenos army was anticipating the Ultramarines' every move and neutralising each set piece they employed. The Codex Astartes has much to say on the subject of engaging a foe with superior technology. Yet every feint and lunge Kalgar made was met with a shield of logic that left his men fighting for their lives. Every plasma volley and melter blast employed against the floating necropolis found its energy dissipated harmlessly. Every bolt or shell was prematurely detonated before it could harm the monoliths within. Crack missiles blew sinister triarch constructs apart only for their glowing remains to scuttle back together moments later. The chapter master felt a cold shiver creep over him, as he realised the Necrons had analysed and broken down the Ultramarines' battle doctrine, just as the Xenos had been studied in their turn. The only hope was to strike from an unexpected direction. Mahed, the gorse pylon that loomed over the battlefield, whirred and pivoted as it fired pinpoint beams of emerald energy into the skies, darting from one aerial target to the next as the strike cruisers far above attempted to reinforce their brethren. Storm Talon and Thunderhawk gunships alike were blasted from the air as the gorse beam stabbed through the swirling snowstorm with pitiless efficiency. Kalgar could just make out a camouflaged squad of scouts, the Ice Talons of the 10th Company, clambering up the base of the gorse pylon and clamping their melter bombs onto its jointed neck before vaulting backward and into the safety of a deep snowdrift. Above them, a white-hot explosion crippled the machine's motive units and uncontrollable gorse energy roared into the night as the resultant energy pulse overloaded its power systems. Inspiration burnt through the chapter master's mind. With his honor guard storming forward in his wake, Kalgar sprinted towards the malfunctioning pylon, smashing his way through the ranks of Necron immortals that were moving to protect it. The chapter master lashed out left and right to pulverize Xenos' torsos and heads wherever he struck. But a terrible wrath was roused within him, then his resolve to reach the gorse pylon was all but unstoppable. Jumping up onto the metallic base of the malfunctioning pylon, Kalgar braced himself and heaved with both hands, at its crescent-shaped superstructure. 
Servos and pistons whined in protest as the famed Gauntlets of Ultramar left grooves in its living metal. Teeth gritted and eyes screwed tight. The chapter master pushed with everything he had, veins popping under his close-cropped grey hair. He roared in pain with the bone-breaking effort of his feet, but sure enough, the pylon began to move on its bearings, its flaring gorse beam crackling across the skies above the warring armies. Slowly, inexorably, Kalgar pushed the war engine's crescent back upon itself till its beam met the energy grid that protected the floating necropolis. The snowstorm flared blindingly white as a tremendous explosion flattened everything within a hundred metres. The autosenses of the space marines spared the majority of them from being blinded by the energy burst, though those nearby were not so lucky. Squads Attrition, Malikus, and Thracius were vaporised in an instant, along with the entire phalanx of Necron warriors they were fighting. The energy shield that protected the floating necropolis vanished, and in the backlash, the Tesserarch vault at its heart was broken wide open. Rising above the Necron army was a giant cruciform figure of pure light. The remnants of its energy cage still crackling around it, it roared in exultation at its newfound freedom. The booming sound throwing ultramarines and necrons alike to the icy ground. Louder and louder it grew until the planet's crust began to crack beneath it. As the being's shout struck the surface's resonant frequency, hurling hundreds of stunned necrons to an icy doom. Tagorius mind pulsed a warning to Kalgar. This being was a manifestation of the star god Ygrenia, the molder of worlds, whose very thoughts could break apart a planet and reshape it in a form more pleasing to him. The floating city had halted at the mighty explosion. At its heart, the gilded Necron overlord known as the Undying was bellowing outraged commands to the glowing figure above them, his arms raised imperiously. With laughter like tectonic plates colliding, the star god reached out a taloned hand and made a fist. Around the Undying, the ground split open, forming a titanic hand that crushed the Necron like an insect. The Xenos Lord flashed white and vanished. At the heart of the Necron tomb complex, the surviving members of Squad Lazarus had reached their objective. The Undying, having phased out moments before, had teleported back to his cabled sarcophagus right in front of their eyes. Unfortunately for the Necron, the Death Watch had replaced his revivication engines with Meltra charges and entropic destabilizers. A thin scream echoed through the Necron tomb as the Death Watch put the lie to the Undying's name, blasting him into his component atoms. On the planet's crust, the Necron forces reeled from the loss of their leader and the power structure at their army's heart. The Ultramarines, their sonic dampeners and optic shields, protecting them from the worst of the Catan's baleful energies, were deft enough to avoid the catastrophic damage that was being wreaked upon Damnos by Yagrinea, the World Shaper. The supporting fire of the Devastator units and Imperial Guard on the ridge overlooking the carnage was taking a heavy toll upon the Necrons that had escaped to the Catan's wrath, and the battle looked all but over until the God Thing turned its wrath on the Space Marines. Lumpen fists of rock burst out from the ground, seizing up the cobalt-armoured warriors, falling back to their transports and crushing them to a paste. Squad after squad were destroyed by the laughing entity as it floated overhead. The being passed over Cato Sicarius as he duelled, the captain panting hard with the exertion of his fight with the flesh-wrapped Necron Lord. The flayed Lord's head snapped up in alarm as it finally registered Yagrinaya's presence, a sliver of opportunity that Sicarius had trained his whole life to exploit. The captain fell to one knee under the creature's flashing talons and rammed the Talazarian Tempest Blade vertically into its torso, shorting out its phase circuits and dooming the fiend to a final death. His vision swimming 
Sicaria summoned twenty-five years of anger and frustration and channeled it into a last burst of strength. He unclipped the strangely wrought grenade that had been given to him by his old friend Imocles in their clandestine meeting and ran headlong towards the Catan that had passed overhead. Leaping over the claws of the flayed ones that grasped for him, he activated the weapon, a vortex grenade of ancient design, and flung it at the creature. The Catan's horned head whipped round in a half-circle, its face contorted with rage, and Sicarius was caught in mid-air by a giant rocky fist. Just as the vice-like fingers began to close, the vortex grenade detonated. A spiralling orb of nothingness burst out from the device, its unstoppable force sucking the Catan into the warp before the vortex collapsed and winked out of existence. Even as Sicarius staggered to his feet, the battle was won. The earthquakes that had spread outwards from the Catan's rampage shuddered to a halt. Over the next few days, the Ultramarines took apart the remainder of the Necron army, with a grim efficiency that saw none of the Xenos survive. Empty tomb complexes were collapsed or detonated under the methodical guidance of the Death Watch, and as massed contingents of the Adeptus Mechanicus arrived, all evidence of the war against the Necrons was eradicated or taken from the planet. Many intriguing items of Xenos technology went missing over the course of the reclamation program, but the air of victory was so infectious that none pressed the matter of their absence too closely. The Necrons of Damnos had finally been defeated. Kalga, who had learned much about the Xenos foe over the course of the campaign, had consolidated the knowledge he had torn from Damnos and penned it into a data scroll, which he circulated throughout the chapter masters of the Adeptus Astartes. Such hard-won data was invaluable. Its distribution was a great strategic victory in its own right, and yet it was not the most lasting lesson the Imperium would take from the reconquest. The populace rescued by Sicarius and the Second Company all those years ago was shipped back from Tarantus and given the entire world of Damnos to claim as its own. The sons and daughters who had joined the Ultramarines were stationed upon the planet to watch over them and train them in the ways of war. Slowly but surely, Damnos was brought back into the Imperial fold. The message was clear, a message stridently broadcast across the Imperium by the agents of the High Lords of Terror. Humanity could triumph over any foe, no matter how deadly. The galaxy belonged to man, and man alone. And there we have it, another little bit of a history lesson for you. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you to everybody supporting the channel. Your names are scrolling by as I speak. And to anyone who would like to support this channel and with things I do here and so I can do more stuff, then please do consider becoming a YouTube member, a patron on Patreon or on subscribe, so whichever suits you best. I know people have different um, views on things, but if you would like to support the channel and my efforts, please do consider doing that or send a super chat in a future video or uh, live stream. It all helps me, and uh, I love doing this stuff, and I'd like to do more, and the more, I, you know, the more support I get, the more I can do. Anyway, I've got a baby on the way, as many know, and I'm talking now in November 2022, and as we go into the Christmas period, my baby's due fairly soon, so I'll be taking a few weeks off, obviously, to take care of him, and as we, you know, as uh, while he's still a baby baby, obviously, I'll be a bit more busy than normal, so expect a, a slight reduction in the output. But still, things will be coming out. And before then, as we go into the Christmas period of 2022, if you're, listen, if you're listening in the future, this means nothing. But for those of you listening now, don't worry. Much more content is coming. A lot more long-form content. Maybe some, short, some story time. Maybe some reviews. Maybe some live streams. Well, definitely live streams. Dark Tide's about to come out soon fully, so I'll do some of that. But to anybody watching, yeah, thank you all again. Please do give this video a like and subscribe. Uh, and uh, give me some comments down below. I really appreciate that for a small channel like mine. That really helps with YouTube's algorithm and uh, it really makes a massive difference. And uh, I mean, it's the least you can do. Come on. It's the least you can do. Why not? Come on. Help me out. Anyway, I'll be back again with more stuff very, very soon. As we go into the Christmas period of 2022, I will strive to get as much stuff out as I can before, uh, before my, my baby comes along. Basically, my son comes along. So after that, obviously, he's going to be coming first. My family's going to be coming first. But um, stuff will still be coming. It just... There might be a bit of a delay in some things, but as we go into the new year, as we go into, as uh, you know, as we go into 2023, 
Expect even more content coming out soon. Also some surprise things. Also some more history stuff. As I mentioned, long-term viewers will know I've been working on some projects, history projects. Uh, you'll, you'll get updates on that very, very soon. But yeah, all stuff is coming. And if you're listening on the podcast, thank you all again for watching. And please do give it a like or a star or whatever it is that people do on the podcast thing. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how all the podcast things work. Sorry. Anyway, I'll be back again soon. Thank you all very much again. And if, uh, what am I saying? Yeah, whatever. I'll see you later. Soon. Bye-bye. Cheers.